Uh, just so everybody's aware, we are recording now. And okay. Um, so we want to welcome everyone tonight. Thank you for taking time out of your evening to join us in our third family university event. Uh, the event for this year, we are recording now, just so you're aware. Um, we have the chat available this evening. Um, and we'll have some time for questions and answers at the end um, with Mr. Gardner and Mrs. Keefe and myself. Um, we would like to uh, introduce uh, Mr. David Gardner, who is the University High School principal. Uh, he is, I, I won't say the class, but he is a Ferndale High School graduate, actually. Uh, and my, I'm not going to lie, but my very good friend. So we're excited um, to have him here today. He is uh, the really the lead educator in our district in restorative practices. He's done training at the admin level and the staff level. Uh, he has instituted restorative practices at um, the building level, and he is um, our go-to person for, for learning about restorative practices and making it a part of who we are in Ferndale. Um, his, our event tonight is focused on giving you a little bit more insight into what restorative practices look like in the school. Um, so um, how you can also use them at home and how these are transferable skills. So Mr. Gardner, I'm going to mute and uh, turn it over to you. All right. Thank you, Mrs. Jeffrey, Mrs. Keith, for having me. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, like Mrs. Jeffrey said, my name is Mr. Gardner. Um, I'm the principal at University High School and also um, lucky and uh, an alum of Ferndale Public Schools, Ferndale High School. Um, I returned to Ferndale and uh, started teaching at University High School uh, with Mrs. Jeffrey, a uh, great colleague, Mrs. Jeffrey has always been. And, um, you know, over time, um, I moved to the counseling position, uh, which is really my passion. Um, I've always known that our kids need um, a little, little more uh, TLC than uh, you know, what I was able to provide as a teacher. Like teaching is great, you know, it was a very noble profession, but uh, what it taught me is that there's, there's something more going on than, than what we're doing you know, with the uh, reading and writing and arithmetic. So I was fortunate to uh, grow into the counseling position at University High School um, and eventually grow into administration. Uh, so tonight, I'm just going to do an introduction of restorative practices and kind of go over some different ways that we see it uh, primarily in our schools, but also ways that we can use it just in our everyday lives, especially um, uh, and particularly when it comes to parenting. Um, I myself am the father of two toddlers. So I find that I recall uh, I call on my counseling and my restorative practice training fairly often <laughs> on a regular basis. Uh, go ahead, Mrs. Jeffrey, to the next slide. This is a restorative practice is a relationship-based approach. So when we talk about restorative practice, we start with the social discipline window. Um, we want to do things with our, our kids. You know, we want to make sure that we have some limits and we want to make sure that we support. Uh, we don't want to be punitive. Uh, punitive, I think, is the approach that has gotten us in a lot of trouble over the years. Uh, you know, a number of us, you know, our school experience, when we think of our teachers, certain teachers, definitely uh, when we think of our administrators, uh, that was a very punitive approach. You didn't want to interact with the administration when I was in school because that meant solely that you were in trouble, most likely. It wasn't really uh, uh, an experience for anything else. So with restorative practice, it's a with approach. We want to make sure that we are supporting our kids and we also have a standard, but we support them through that standard. So when we look at this, we don't want to be, we don't want to do things to them. That's punitive. We don't want to do things for them because that creates a different sort of problem where kids become very, we're very permissive and we allow certain things. In some instances, restorative practices is kind of uh, misapplied to, to mean that, you know what, kids can do whatever they want and, you know, we're, we're just not going to issue any discipline. Uh, that's kind of a misnomer of how restorative practices should be applied. And we definitely don't want to be neglectful and just not do anything and let kids go and do things however they want because, you know, that is definitely neglect on all levels. So restorative practices is all about doing things with. And I'm going to talk a lot about relationships because, again, um, like one of my mentors, Julie uh, McDaniel Muldoon says, relationships are all. And uh, I think that we can all agree that when we have, you know, a healthy relationship, a relationship that's built upon positive 
you know, principles that we are more inclined to perform, you know, for those people and with those people. Go ahead, Mrs. Shepard. I'm gonna try to move this from the bottom. If I can. Oh, there we go. All right, um, the restorative practices continuum. One of my favorite things about restorative practices is that it allows us to initiate um, contact and behaviors in an effective way, which means that we don't respond. If you look at that continuum, you see that it's 80% proactive and 20% responsive. I always like to say, if we're responding, you know, it's already too late. Um, a lot of restorative practices is, is the, the informal, the affective statements, the affective questions. When you get to the middle of that continuum, you see small impromptu conversations. This is just where, you know, you kind of step in and you may have to ask a kid a couple of questions, just engaging them about something that's going on um, that you may see it. It may be of a concern. Uh, move to the more formal end of things. That's when we have restorative circles and formal conferences. Now, the circles and the conferences can be used for a number of things. We won't focus too much on those because that's more of a group setting. Uh, the group setting end of restorative practice is more with the classroom. But the affective statements, the affective questions, and the small and prompt to conversations, that's more of the 80% of restorative practices. And again, if you, uh, you want to be proactive, not reactive when it comes to restorative practices. Go ahead, Mrs. Jeff. Some examples of effective statements and effective questions. Traditionally, we, we kind of go with uh, things like stop, stop making fun of her, stop doing that. You know, sit down, be quiet. You shouldn't be doing that. Um, so instead of things like that, which can uh, send kids into a feeling of shame or feeling like they're doing something wrong, we like to try to appeal to them in the relationship that we have with them. Because if we have relationships with any kid, whether it's our own or a student, we know that we can appeal to them in the things that we teach them in terms of their, their moral compass, their, their sense of right and wrong. So instead of stop making fun of her, you can say, it's funny to you, but it makes her feel bad. Because when we talk to our kids and our students about the way we want to Im impact people in relationships we want to have, one thing we don't want is to make people feel bad because none of us likes to be made to feel bad. Even if you know a student or a kid says they do, we know that that's coming from someplace else. Uh, sit down and be quiet. You know, nobody likes to be ordered around. Uh, it helps me answer more questions if you're in your seat and listening quietly. You know, I definitely want us to go to the park, but before we can go to the park, I need you to sit down so we can tie up your shoes. Uh, you shouldn't do that. You know, that's, that's an immediate prohibition of a behavior that could send a kid again into that uh, compass of shame, which we'll, we'll get into a little later. Instead of you shouldn't do that, you can appeal to them. I know you can make better choices. I know you know what to do right here. You know, I, I, I know you do it. You know, you, ex you instill that confidence and let them know that you believe that they can make the better choices. Instead of um, these uh, questions, you know, again, these, these types of questions that create shame because they make a kid feel bad and can kind of put them in a defensive mode. What did you do? You know, one of the things that, that these questions to me are um, huge no-nos. You know, when you ask a kid, what did you, what did you do? If somebody asked me what I do, I feel defensive automatically. Instead of what did you do? You know, you have, you ask your, your, your son or daughter or your student, you know, tell me what happened. Just, you know, tell me what happened. Tell me about what happened today. And immediately, you know, they don't feel that same sense of shame. Why questions? I learned this, you know, when I went through uh, got the counseling training, you know, why questions are a huge no-no because again, it creates negative feelings in the person on the receiving end. What were you thinking at the time? You know, you want them to get into that thought process. And part of that, that rapport that you build through the therapeutic approach and through just the relationship that you have, it, it, you can get kids to reflect about what, the, what their thought process was at the time, because there's something that they were thinking, you know, when they engaged in that behavior. Did you think about the consequences? Of course not, you know? I mean, I can think of a lot of things that I did and I wasn't thinking about the consequences when I was younger. Um, what have you thought about since then? Again, you want to get into that thought process that they can think about the, the things that they're doing and maybe some choices that they can make next time. So affective statements and affective questions. Next slide, please. You know, I kind of came up with this wish list because when I think about how we want our schools and our relationships and everything to look, these are some of the things that I think we can all agree on. Um, we want to have positive relationships. 
we want to have positive and productive students because we know when kids feel good, they perform better. We all want our to be satisfied, whether it's our own families or our neighbors or our friends or our school community families, we want everyone to be satisfied. Of course, that's going to look like different things for different people, but satisfaction, I think, is a great goal to have on a wish list. Uh, positive and productive people in general in the school community, not just the students, but everyone, because again, it's a whole school community and we need all those parts and we want all those parts and the people involved to be working together in a positive and productive manner. Safe environment. Um, physically, culturally, emotionally, any other way you can think of, everyone wants to feel safe and, and it is entitled to that. I think that's a, a, a right of all of us in our, in our schools, our communities, and in our homes. High achievement. Um, everybody wants to do, we want everyone to do their best as much as possible. You know, that's going to look like, again, different ways for different people, but high achievement is definitely on that wish list. And just that our school is the place to be, you know, I kind of throw that in there because that that feeling of just like this is this is it like I, I really like it here. I'm really happy here. You know, of course, you know, every everything has its struggles and its challenges, but it's how we meet those challenges. So the goal isn't to be, you know, trouble or problem free is to be able to resolve and work through those problems. Go ahead, Miss Jeffrey. Now, one of the uh, founding principles of restorative practices uh, in order to cultivate these relationships that we need is understanding the difference between empathy and sympathy. So this is a very short clip um, that I think embodies the differences between empathy and sympathy. All right, I'm gonna give it a try. I gotta share my video. <laughs> Hold on, share my, let me share my sound. Um, Okay. Even without sound, it's just uh, there's just music, so the visuals will tell the tale. Thank you, Ms. Jeffrey. Go ahead and uh, go to the next slide. So what we see there just encapsulated is empathy versus sympathy. Um, one of the greatest challenges I think that we have when we're working with young people is uh, sometimes their experiences will cause us to feel bad for them. And immediately um, it makes them feel again, uh, that, that shame feeling and makes them defensive because the one thing I know about kids and all the time I've worked with them is that they're very, very resilient and uh, they can endure a lot. And especially working with older kids, uh, at least in my experience, they can be uh, very proud and they should be, you know, because nobody wants to feel, nobody wants anyone to feel bad for them. Uh, it doesn't mean that they don't want anybody to be in it with them. You know, uh, the you, the me, and that we, that's right in the middle. That's, that's more so what we mean when we talk about empathy in terms of restorative practice. And I just included the one with the teddy bear because I think it's uh, super cute and it kind of conveys uh, that same empathy message in a, in a visual way. Uh, go to the next one, please, Mr. Jeff. Empathy is not feeling sorry for, it's not doing for, or fixing for, um, it's not dismissive. Uh, one of the things that I think we do sometimes with young people is to blame it on youth. You know, it's not really important. You're just young. You know, you, you'll know that things aren't that important. Um, one of the huge red flags because to them in that moment, whatever that thing is that they're engaged with, that's, that's really important to them. And it's uh, very dismissive and it doesn't create that empathy to tell them, oh, you're just young. Um, I know exactly how you feel because when I was your age. Now, we were that age and it could be true. I'm not saying that it's not true when we as older people say that to younger people, 
But if you think back, and this is um, what I've always felt is a, a strength of mine. Um, when I was young, I didn't want to hear that. You know, it didn't, it didn't, it turned me right off, you know, to, to trying to get help or reaching out to anyone or trying to connect with someone when they said they knew how I felt because they were my age. You know, one thing I've learned um, as I get older, uh, which is evident by all the gray hair that I have, is that, you know, while things and struggles are consistent, you know, the way it looks is really different. You know, uh, when I sit and I talk to kids, some of the things that they convey, the experiences, while at, at their core, they're very similar, the circumstances are, are way different. Um, it will be all right. It's not that bad. Again, that's a way of minimizing, you know, their experience. And it's not necessarily helpful. Now, that's kind of um, counterintuitive because, of course, we want to help the kid. We want to help our kids. We want to help our students. We want to help any kid that's in distress or any person for that matter. But we want to make sure that that help is what they're looking for, what they ask for. We don't want to just assume and lead with that help. So it's not typically helpful. Next slide, please. Ms. Another principle of restorative practices is the idea of equity. Um, this graphic here has been recreated a number of ways, but I, I feel like it is, you know, a very simple and effective explanation of when we talk about equality versus equity. Um, go to the next slide. He's beautiful. I don't care about just selfish. That I'm not a real. And this is another brief video, uh, which a crash course on equity, which I think is very effective in communicating the difference between equity versus equality. And I want you to go into this and remember that fair is not always equal. Go ahead, Mr. Jeffrey. Today, we are talking about equity and equality. But you might be wondering, wait, aren't these the same thing? They look the same. They sound similar. So aren't they the same? No, in fact, they're really different concepts, even though a lot of us get the two confused. So let's break them down. You probably already know what we mean when we say equality. We're talking about two things that are the same or have a similar value. When we treat two people or two groups of people equally, we make sure that they have or get the same things. For example, if I wanna give Betty some apples, then I need to give Ben the same number of apples to treat them with equality. Along the same lines, if I want to give the nursing program a budget increase, then I need to make sure that I give the culinary arts program the same budget increase to treat them with equality. That makes sense. But that's not the same thing as equity. Equity can be defined as giving everyone what they need to be successful. In other words, it's not giving everyone the exact same thing. And here's where the difference between equity and equality really come in, because it's important to remember that if we give everyone the exact same thing, expecting that we'll make people equal, it assumes that everyone started out in the same place. So here's an example. In this instance, we give everyone the exact same box, we treat them with equality so that they can see over the fence. Well, that's great for the person on the left because they were already taller, but it's not so great for the person on the right who still can't see over the fence. From an equity perspective, we wouldn't want everyone to have the same size box because everyone isn't the same height to start out with. With an equity mindset, we would get everyone what they need to raise them up to the same level. Here's another example. With equality in mind, we can treat everyone the same and give them all the same bike. But that doesn't really help the person on the left who can't ride that kind of bike or the person in the middle that is too small for that bike. So when we think about this situation with equity in mind, equity tells us that we need to give everybody a different kind of bike so they can all enjoy a bike ride. As you might guess, this is where the concept of fairness gets tricky for some folks. We often think that being fair means that everybody gets the same thing. And that's what we were taught when we were growing up. But fairness really only works when we're all the same to start out with. So this is a new idea for many of us to think about. There is this great American saying that people just need to work hard enough and pull themselves up by their own bootstraps. 
It's this idea that everyone can be successful if you just work hard enough. Well, that's a lot easier to do when some of us were born with longer arms to pull up those bootstraps, or maybe we were given longer bootstraps when we bought our boots. So let's think about moving away from the bootstrap idea and instead think about shoes. There is a quote by Nahid Dasani that goes, equality is giving everyone a shoe, but equity is giving everyone a shoe that fits. One of my favorite things about restorative practice is that it allows us to take an equitable approach, you know, to focus on equity. Um, one of the biggest issues with uh, punitive discipline is, you know, things like zero tolerance. If you do this thing and this is what's going to happen. When we take a restorative approach, what we're looking at is each individual student and their circumstances, especially if we take an affirmative approach, we are aware on where our students and our kids are going to struggle and what they're going to need in the event that there is anything that happens. So that's what, like the equity part, so sometimes I think it's hard to make the connection between like, what does equity have to do with restorative practice? Restorative practice allows us to, to take an equity approach. It gives us that freedom because it encourages, okay, we're gonna look at the, these students, we're gonna look at this kid, we're gonna look at their situation, their circumstances based on what we know about them, and then we can help them from that approach. Next slide, please, Mrs. Jeffrey. Another aspect of uh, restorative practice is culturally responsive teaching or just practices in general. Sometimes we interpret behaviors incorrectly because we don't have the right cultural lens. We're not aware of the cultural, the cultural aspects of the students or the kids that we're interacting with. Um, he won't even look me in the eye. That's how I know he's, you know, you can fill in the blank. That's how I know he's, uh, he, he's guilty. That's how I know that, you know, he's uh, whatever, whatever you can fill in there. Uh, she doesn't even care. Look at her. You know, we look at a kid's affect and the way that they're behaving, or maybe their expression, and we make certain assumptions. Uh, sometimes we can create a situation when we ask kids certain questions. Uh, what did you get for your birthday? What did you get for Christmas? What did you get for this holiday? You know, where did you go, for, you know, for uh, summer break? Did you travel, you know, some of these things can kind of trigger, you know, responses in kids without us being aware if we're not culturally responsive and aware. If he cared, he would exhibit X behavior. You know, if he cared, he he wouldn't, you know, he would do this or he wouldn't do that. Uh, one of the big ones that I think um, a lot of us as educators have learned over the years is, you know, you wouldn't be sleepy if you went to bed at night, not knowing, you know, what that kid's night was like. Uh, so again, these are things that we have to ingrain in ourselves and really do some formal training and research and reflection about, okay, what is the culturally responsive approach to whatever the situation may be with this particular kid or student. Next slide, please, Mrs. Jeffrey. And there's levels, levels of culture also. And this is important because we have surface level, which if you look at that uh, graphic there, that's like the leaves on a tree. You know, that's things like songs and, you know, food, clothing, dances, hairstyles. Those are things that we kind of can see. And, you know, uh, those are observable. And they have a slight but low emotional impact on trust. Like, you know, a, a kid will appreciate that you acknowledge and know those things, but it doesn't really build uh, that, that deep trust. When we get to the shallow culture, uh, those are more unspoken rules that create a higher, have a higher emotional impact uh, on trust. Uh, concepts of time, personal space, eye contact, uh, nonverbal communication, et cetera. And then we get to the deep, the roots uh, that have an intense um, impact on uh, emotional trust. Uh, notions of fairness, which I think is a, is, is a huge one. That really stands out to me. Decision-making, uh, worldview, concepts of self, et cetera. Uh, so when we talk about culture, we wanna make sure we understand the social political context. We wanna be aware of implicit bias and uh, structural racialization. So there's lots of aspects to culture. And this is a constant ongoing thing. You know, this can be, you know, in the school and even within our own family groups sometimes because, you know, depending on the dynamics of our family, we have a lot to learn. And we wanna make sure that we are responsible in how we interact and we, you know, we uh, address and, and deal with our, our, our children on all levels. Uh, next slide, please, Mrs. Jeffrey. Culturally responsive mindset. 
Uh, we will be intentional. We will be aware and familiar. We will adjust our lens and we will avoid our own bias. This isn't, uh, we're gonna try. Uh, this isn't, we're gonna work on it. These are the things that we must do if we are going to be effective in culturally responsive mindset and engage in restorative practice, engage in equitable practices. All of these things, we have to do these things. Uh, these are all things that we can do with the right amount of work. Um, is it easy? You know, is it something maybe you never looked into? Um, yeah, I mean, it's not easy. Um, it could be something that you've never addressed and you never thought was something that you needed to do, but it's important because these really drive the restorative process because these principles and these practices will help to develop that relationship. And remember, like the, at the foundation of all this, at the foundation of all of our interactions is the relationships that we, we, we make and we forge with people. Next slide, please. How well do we know our kids? Um, a big thing we have to do is, yep, yeah, Zaretta Heaven, thank you, Diana. We have to identify who our students are. We have to be aware of any potential trauma, past and or present. Um, we have to understand a historical context of the relationship between the school community, the students and the parents slash family. Um, I'm gonna stop on that one for a while, uh, for just a brief moment. Sometimes, you know, we're not aware. Um, when you have kids that come, you know, like maybe their parent, you know, was a student in the district and then they have multiple children that have come through the district. Um, you wanna make sure you're aware of that, what, the, the context of their relationship. Maybe they had a, a negative experience, maybe they had a great experience. It's almost like when we uh, were in school in the, in the old days and a, a teacher said, oh, I had your brother. And immediately, you know, there's some things that, that they may think about you based on that experience. Um, and it's important that we know that, but we don't wanna let that uh, drive our interactions with that student, except for to be aware of what they may be coming to us with. Uh, we wanna make sure we understand the current context of that relationship. And we wanna be clear about the direction of the relationship because we have to have goals. How we want this to go is it has to be something that we actively work on. You know, relationships and things can't just happen in a vacuum. And that's where the affirmative part of restorative practice allows us to set the table for that relationship. Uh, next slide, please. We wanna be trauma informed, like we were just kind of alluded to in the last slide, but what does a student who has been exposed to trauma look like? Um, if you look at this graphic, we know, I mean, it can look like any student, you know, uh, from any background, from any race, any gender, any identity, we don't know. You know, we can, sometimes we uh, unfortunately make assumptions just because a student comes from a certain background that they may not have been exposed to any sort of trauma. And the only way we know is to do our due diligence and to make sure that we are aware of who our kids are. Uh, we can't make any assumptions. We can't assume because a student lives in this area that, oh, they've had a terrible life. We can't assume that a student lives in another area that they've had a wonderful life. Uh, it is our job and our responsibility to identify and make sure that we're ready to support our students. Next slide, please. Adverse childhood experiences or ACEs are, are potentially traumatic events that occur in childhood from zero to 17 years. Now, uh, there is um, uh, a test that you can take uh, yourself. I didn't include that here, but if you're interested in that, um, I know Mrs. Jeffrey and Ms. Keith have, uh, have, experience, have experience with that, know how to locate that, that test. Um, but things like experiencing violence or abuse, witnessing violence in the home or community, or having a family member attempt or die by su suicide, these are all things that are potentially traumatic events that some of our kids unfortunately may experience. And then from the ages of zero to 17 years. Next slide, please. Also included are aspects of the child's environment that can undermine their sense of safety, stability, and bonding. Sometimes kids struggle with connecting with us as adults. Um, sometimes it's because of what they've experienced. They may have been victims or have seen substance misuse. Uh, mental health problems may be something that they're experiencing in their home community instability due to parental separation or household members being in jail or in prison. Uh, they're linked to chronic health problems, mental illness and substance misuse in adulthood. They can also negatively impact education and job opportunities. However, there are some ways that we can address that. Next slide, please. Now, um, the therapeutic approach is um, a huge part of restorative practices that really appeal, made it appeal to me because what I saw there is rapport. 
You know, when I, when I see um, affirmative questions, when I hear, hear affirmative statements, that is in the counseling and the therapy approach, that is rapport building. Uh, so we wanna have a counseling mindset. One of the things that um, was really important to me in transitioning uh, from being a teacher counselor to administration is um, I started out as an assistant principal and I did not, I refused to be identified as the person who does the discipline as an assistant principal. Um, that's not the mindset. My mindset has always been as a counselor. Uh, I realized, you know, no matter where I go in life, that's the mindset that I carry around when I'm interacting, especially with young people, because, you know, I was a young person once, uh, as we all were, and, you know, there's, uh, it's a very lonely feeling, you know, to have things that you want to get help with that you want to talk about and not feel like there's someone that you can connect with. Uh, so that counseling mindset of building rapport, of active listening. Um, I'm a terrible multitasker and um, I used to be frustrated with that. But when I got into uh, the counseling profession and the therapeutic approach, I realized that it's a strength. Um, so we want to be active listeners when we're engaging with our kids. You know, um, the phones, the tablets, the laptops, um, when I'm interacting with the kid, I, I put that stuff to the side because it's important that I'm actively engaged in what they're telling me. You know, they're the most important person in the room at that time. And I bring that home with my kids also. Uh, Open-ended questions. If you're gonna ask a question, and this goes with all kids, ask a question. Uh, rhetorical questions um, can be frustrating because if you're asking a question and it's rhetorical, then the kid can become disengaged. You know, they get to they get to thinking in their mind, why are you even asking a question if you already know the answer? And again, if we recall our own experience, uh, there's this idea of the person of the teacher uh, when we do when we do some workshopping with new teachers is to remember, you know, who you were as a kid and kind of carry that with you. Uh, rhetorical questions were always very frustrating. And I think even as adults, when, when people ask us rhetorical questions, rhetorical questions, it can be frustrating. Um, also, interacting with the person in crisis. Uh, there are certain things that we want to do when we're interacting with the person in crisis. We want to de-escalate, not escalate. That's also a therapeutic approach, a concept that's rooted in therapy. Not only what you say, but also how you say it. Okay, we can say the same thing, and it can be completely different in how it's perceived based on how we say it. Uh, one of the, the strongest concepts, again, in this approach for me is uh, big picture versus the moment. We are not here to win, uh, whether it's with our, our kids at home, whether it's with our students. It's not a win-lose, like we're the adult, you know, uh, we, we know where this is going for the most part. Um, we have to make sure that we're not focused on winning in that moment, because it's not a win-loss situation. What it is, is it's a helping situation. And we want to empower and advocate, not to be confused with enabling and helping. Um, when we empower kids, I always like the analogy of uh, teaching people to fish versus giving them fish. You know, if you just keep handing them fish, you'll be giving them fish for a long time. But if we empower them and teach them to fish for themselves, they can eat forever. And we want to be advocates for our kids. We don't necessarily have to always help them, but we want to advocate for them and teach them, more importantly, to advocate for themselves. Next slide, please. I just want to add, Mr. Gardner, I'm, as a parent of a fifth and a second grader at home during this time, I'm really thankful for this slide. I, I know this is what we do in school and what our goals are, but this is so important at the parent level as well. Um, mm -hmm. I know you have a second meeting at seven, so I just want, it's like 6.30. Oh, yeah, sorry, I want sorry. To give a few minutes for questions, so. Okay, yeah, I'll, we'll pick it up a little. Sorry about that. I'm long-winded sometimes. Uh, some subtle practices, again, to build uh, rapport. I kind of think of this um, as uh, community building and also kind of a customer service approach. When people, you know, come into my office, when they come into my home, um, we're talking about us as a, as a community. I like to use inclusive pronouns. Our, us, we, this is our school. This is our home. Uh, one of my favorite things, and it sounds really simple, is that when we come home, my son, my oldest son, he knows that this is his house. You know, which is something I, I didn't have my own home growing up. We moved around a lot, but that's a, a sidetrack. But, you know, our, this is our school, our community, you know, creating that sense of ownership. When kids come in, how can I help you today? You know, it sounds like I'm working somewhere, but I am I'm working in a school. I'm not working retail, but I want to know how I can help you today. Offer refreshments, letting people know when they come in. You know, I know you have things to do, valuing their time, uh, thanking people for taking the time. To, to spend with you, you know, thank you for coming by. Thank you for, you know, for spending that time with me. 
and always lead people to let 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 me know if there's anything else that I can do to help. You know, because that's that creates that sense of community and that us, that we, that our, that relationship. Next slide, please. Sorry. Um, so in restorative practice, there's kind of this relationship based approach, these guidelines. Um, we want to build relationship and community involving kids and families. You want to ask for help rather than reporting wrongdoing. Um, when there's something, an incident, when there's a behavior, when I reach out to families, what I ask is, I really need your help. You know, can you help me out with this? Like, I'm looking for some direction here. You know, I know you've known, you know, your, your child, your kid, their whole life. You know, I've only known them for a couple of years. There's something that you can help. Can you help me out with this? Can you help me figure out, you know, how we can best support him or her? Uh, setting the tone. Lead by example. Um, kids pick up on hypocrisy very quickly. They notice. My five-year-old, he knows, like, uh, Dad, you're not supposed to be... Um, you can't have your phone and watch TV at the same time. You have to choose one. Oh, every time. And he is relentless. So I have to make sure that I'm leading by example. Uh, touch points. Uh, make contact as much as possible, especially affirmatively. Because again, none of these things are going to eliminate any behaviors happening. But what we want to do is repair and bring things back you know, to a positive place as quickly as possible. Give kids the benefit of the doubt. You know, Trust them. You know, I ask, <laughs> I ask my youngest son questions all the time. He's only three and I give him the benefit of doubt and you know, that he's telling me the truth that he's done the right thing, even though a lot of times he hasn't, but he's only three. Uh, coaching the consequences. Uh, discipline is the last resort. If it's something that we're going to get to at all, I prefer to help. Uh, but more people feel that they're going to be disciplined regardless of age, the less they are to be forthcoming about the things that they're struggling with. If they feel like they're going to get in trouble, it can create the, this defensiveness and make them close off. And there's always a path back. Of course, there's exceptions to every rule. There are extreme incidents that can send things in a direction that we may not be able to repair. But 99 times out of 100, there's a, there's a path back. Again, uh, more inquiry questions, you know, tell me what happened, uh, which isn't really, you know, it's not really questions, it's inquiry, which is why I didn't call it questions. Uh, tell me how you think, tell me what you could have said or done differently, just a few of those. Go ahead, Ms. Jeffrey, I wanna make sure I don't uh, leave some time for questions, sorry. Uh, this is that compass of shame. So shame is bad, it's very simple. Uh, it can lead to withdrawal, attacks on the, the kid attacking himself, avoidance, or, or lashing out at others. So we want to make sure that we don't send anyone into a shame spiral. Next one. I want to add again, such an important one as a parent. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I caught myself yeah. spiraling my children into shame. Mm -hmm. And you know, because when you ask them, they give you that look and they kind of, the head goes down, you know, the voice drops. Uh, fair process. Now, fair process is priceless. Uh, individuals are most likely to trust and cooperate freely with systems, whether they themselves win or lose by those systems when fair process is observed. Simply stated, if people feel like they're gonna get a fair shake, they're usually, they're, they're more inclined to accept the outcome. Uh, three basic principles. We wanna engage people. We wanna make sure that we offer uh, clear explanations and that we expect clarity. So that the expectations are made clear, we offer explanations, and then we engage people. Those are three simple pro uh, principles of fair process. What does fair process achieve? It builds trust, voluntary cooperation. And I'm going to kind of hit that one for a second, because what that means is that people aren't complying. They co they're cooperating voluntarily because they know that this process and this system, this person, Whatever it is, is fair and is treating them fairly. Most people just want to be treated fairly. Um, what is this down here? Ooh, this thing is in a way. Uh, knowledge sharing, beyond duty. I can't even, what's that under talk? I just see talking here. So I'm going to try to move Drives this up. performance. Thank you. Drives performance. Sorry, I don't know it all by heart. All right, and it drives the performance. Uh, go ahead, Ms. Jeffrey. Now, restorative practices at home. Uh, this, is, this is a very practical approach to kind of how we can practice restorative practices at home. We have to talk with our kids regularly, um, whether that be meals, whether it be uh, having a formal family meeting, 
um, outings. One of the things I look forward to uh, when it's just me and if I'm lucky, uh, if I'm lucky enough uh, to have one of my, my kids alone is that we have a specific outing designed around something that they enjoy so that we can have a conversation or I play something with them, with them that they like. Uh, with meals, you know, uh, we sit around and, you know, they'll tell me about their day. It'll give me a chance to kind of uh, probe and inquire, especially uh, if I've, you know, been at work all day. Uh, reframe behavior. Um, <laughs> my youngest son, I laugh every time I talk about him because he's uh, very spirited and he does a lot of things where we have to sit down and reframe the behavior because um, my, my ultimate goal is he does things that, you know, people may describe as uh, the B word, which I don't use. Uh, so I have to make sure that I help him see, you know, that, you know, while he did this thing that he wasn't supposed to do, it doesn't make him a bad person because he's not a bad person. He did something that he wasn't supposed to do. So I've worked to reframe the behavior to make sure that he understands, OK, this isn't something that you should do, but it doesn't mean that you're a bad person. Uh, we have to pause. Our kids are watching and learning. That's a big one for me. You know, uh, when, when you know you open a bottle of water and dump it out on the floor, immediately I'm like, ah, but I always have to take that deep breath, you know, not saying that I'm 100 for 100 percent, but I'll have we have to pause and make sure that because because our kids are watching our reactions. And when they have a frustrating moment, they're going to mimic that behavior because they've seen us do it. And, and where they're what, some of their greatest role models, if not the greatest one. And again, we want to ask the right questions, effective relationship-based relationship questions. Go ahead, Mrs. Jeffrey. These are some of the impacts that it has on staff. And if we go to the next slide, uh, these are some of the impacts that it has on students. Reduction in punitive discipline, reduction in incidents of interpersonal conflict, increased sense of community, belonging, buy-in, fairness, whether the outcome is positive or negative, which leads to improved school culture, and you know, people do better. They do better when they feel better. Next slide, please. Uh, impact on families, reduction in incidents of interpersonal conflict, improved communication of thoughts and feelings. Uh, that emotional intelligence is huge. Um, increased empathy, increased autonomy, reinforces fair process and shifts focus to maintaining and repairing relationships. One of the most important skills I think uh, that we can teach our kids is you know, uh, one of the things I say is everybody's going to be here. You know, nobody's going anywhere. You know, nobody's going to disappear. Nobody's getting kicked out. Nobody's getting, I mean, everybody's going to be here. So we have to make sure that we work on the relationships that we have. So restorative practice shifts that focus to maintaining and repairing relationships. Next slide, please. This is just, uh, we don't have to watch this, but this is, uh, I remember some years ago, kid, uh, kid president always thought it was like the funniest thing in the world. So this is just 20 things that we can say more often to our kids to help them during this challenging time. But we don't have to go into that. I wanna make sure I leave room uh, for some Q&A. Yeah, I can put, I'll stop sharing in a second. I'll put that link in the chat. That's, we show, okay. all the, we show it to the fuel kids every year. It's one of our okay, favorites. good. Yeah, I love it. I love kid president. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're going to, Miss uh, Keith, if you want to run the chat and ask Mr. Gardner any questions, this would be, Mr. Gardner, Gardner does have a meeting. He's running for employees at seven o'clock. Um, so he doesn't have too much time, but if you have uh, any burning questions, um, and then Miss Keith and I will stay on for anything additional. Why is it here? You can either unmute or put it in the chat or any anything else. Any questions? I do want to read Kirsten's in the chat. Uh, she said, I try to remember to extend those practices to myself. There is a path back from a moment of impatience or frustration with my kids. I too can reset and retry. She said, mm -hmm. thank you, Mr. Gardner, for this presentation. Just what she needed to hear today. Thank you. You know, I, it helps me too. I, I know we've all been there where we kind of, that's why I have to do this, you know, that, whew, you know, <laughs> so thank you. Thank you for having me. So we say, uh, be a star, stop, take a deep breath and relax. All of us can do that anytime we need to be a star. I like that. That's the first time I've heard that. I want to use that. Okay. Yeah. Stop, take a deep breath and relax. You know, it's funny, my three-year-old, we do deep breaths and it's the cutest thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. 
Any, no other questions for Mr. Gardner? Again, Ms. Keefe and I will stay on if you have any K-5 specific, but I do wanna give you a little break, Mr. Gardner, before you go to your, your meeting, so. Yes, appreciate you joining us tonight. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Great. I learned a lot. <laughs> Lots of thank yous in the chat, so. All right. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Gardner. All right. Thank you for having me. Have a great evening, everyone. See you. Um, we are going to keep recording for just a couple minutes. So if anybody has any school questions, um, hey there. Um, <laughs> for Mrs. Keep and I, we will stay on. Otherwise, we hope you have a great evening and we'll send the recording out. Yes. <laughs> hey, cutie. <laughs> I'll put a plug in for story time tomorrow night, seven o'clock. There's three great stories that we'll be reading. All right, I'm going to stop recording this key.